Awesome. Okay. And somebody started the closed captioning and we're on record. Fantastic. Got it. Okay. I'm going to do the intro. I need to share my screen. Where? Well, hello there. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to We Believe in Comics Friday Night Workshops at the Sequential Artist Workshop. So uh, uh, Tom can't be with us tonight because he's at Carol Tyler's farm in Kentucky helping to prepare it for visiting artists and the Wi-Fi is terrible. So he asked me to step in. SAW is a 501c3 nonprofit with online courses. It's a school, it's a community. We've got some upcoming classes. I want to tell you about Bootlegger's Guide to Color with Jess Ruppelson starting Wednesday, June 21st, Procreate Basics, having trouble speaking all of a sudden, with Donna uh, Drew, <laughs> Drew Connors. Um, that starts Wednesday, June 24th. We've got Graphic Poetry and Collage with Kelsey Ervick. That starts Monday, July 17th. And then in person in Gainesville at SAW, Tom is returning for his Comics Visionary week-long workshop, uh, July 24th to 28th. I did the virtual version of that last summer and it was fantastic. And next week here at Friday Night Comics, we have something blocking it, um, uh, uh, Trinidad Escobar. We survive from tuitions and donations. If you donated tonight, thank you. This helps pay the artists um, and uh, um, makes us able to bring free programs like this tonight. Uh, you can also support SAW at PayPal or on our Patreon page. Consider becoming a sustaining member of SAW. Hey, that's Barry in the middle. Uh, share on social media with the hashtag Friday Night Comics and at Comics Workshop. Join us for free anytime at the SAW sharing site. That's members.sawcomics.org. Please, no inappropriate speech or imagery. Sometimes we have children here. Keep it PG-13, please. No trolling or hate speech or explicit language. Thank you. Enjoy or try to enjoy if you're somebody like me who never enjoys anything. <laughs> Tonight, draw about your all-time favorite TV show with Henry Chamberlain. You can find Henry on Instagram at, at comicsgrinder or his website, comicsgrinder.com. And now stop here. And it's all to you now, Henry. Oh, Hi. great. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Thank you to everyone at Sequential Artists Workshop. I'll start by uh, trying to recreate the, the photo, the intro photo. That's me with my book. This is George's Run, A Writer's Journey Through the Twilight Zone. And it's published by uh, Rutgers University Press. And this is like a, a cartoonist uh, dream to, to be uh, published by, uh, by no, a notable publisher. Of, of course, self-publishing, that's, that's great too, because there's a lot of benefits to self-publishing, but then there's a lot of benefits to, well, just great. It's fun and it's, it's, it's worthwhile. And it's such a wonderful organization, Rutgers. So before I babble, I, I I do have a script that I'm trying to follow, but not too uh, too scripted. <laughs> I want to explain what we're going to try to accomplish, and I have two um, two voting uh, things I want to do. I want to ask everybody: Do you have a good idea of what you'd like to create tonight? Yes or no? In terms of a favorite TV show, Henry? Yeah, it, as, as far as, as you understand, you're, you're doing something having to do with your favorite TV show. Do you have a pretty good idea of what you'd like to do? <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of no's. <laughs> okay, that's good. Some yeses and maybe. Some yeses. Okay, question number two. Do you have a preference? Are you just fine with, with having the TV show as your theme or would you rather do something else, say movies? TV or movies? Movies. Okay. 
maybe one for TV, two for movies. I heard a very adamant movie, so that's <laughs> it's adaptable, so it's fine. Uh, I'm going to talk about this. I guess I'm only human. I'm going to try to. I'm going to stick with the TV format, but it's adaptable to movies too. So uh, people would rather just do a, a a movie. They can do that. Everybody can just. Yes. Yes. Okay. And I was, cool. As I was telling Michael, it's interesting because there's maybe two uh, ways of looking at this. Maybe there's an advantage if you had just revisited a particular TV show and now you're going to put your thoughts down as, as to what you liked about it or loved about it. Or maybe it's just as interesting to have a, a, a vague recollection. So maybe your your recollection might be a little different from what the actual TV show was like. It's like say maybe uh, uh, the last episode of MASH, for instance, for, for us older folks. And I, I'm also very self-aware of the fact that I'm I'm part of the Generation X demographic. So my childhood, my growing up was all pre-internet. And a lot of the stuff I was watching uh, was uh, syndicated stuff, uh, stuff that the affiliates were king back then on, on TV. So you had all these horror shows and obscure shows and whatever whatever the affiliates wanted to do on an afternoon. Uh, so, and that that's all gone now. And we also had the big three networks. They were, they were king, as I'm sure everyone of, of a certain vintage will will attest. Yes, the three the three big networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, they dominated the 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 pop cultural landmark uh, uh, lands landscape, uh, our own psyche, because because we we trusted Walter Cronkite. What he said was we really <laughs> trusted Walter. We don't do that anymore, really. There's so everything's been disrupted. There's the lines have been blurred. So. Uh, I, I wonder what people, some of the younger people, what do you think of when you hear TV show? And I, it sounds like I might be heading on to a rabbit hole or something, but this is all leading up to something. I, I do wonder what do younger people think of TV shows? Uh, and my answer, one, one answer is succession, because that's a show that you have to really keep. And it's not even true anymore. I, I think about this. We watched it. Jennifer and I, we watched it religiously week after week, as you would a TV show back in the day. Of course, you don't have to do that. And it's on HBO, for goodness sake. HBO, decades back, it, it was a disruptor. I remember as a kid, we were lucky enough to have cable and we had HBO. And it was an incredible novelty not to have to sit down at a specific time to watch a show. You could watch it again, an hour later, or the next day, or whenever you wanted to see it. And that slowly took on. I think in some rural areas, HBO was big and it it's gradually grew. Uh, but uh, my book is something that uh, covers a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about, just the, the pop culture, with George being the unifying figure that, that gives, it, uh, gives it a narrative flow. So let me switch over. I want to show you this. These are my prepared notes explain what George is about a little bit in a nutshell. It's just, it's just a few pages. So I had an idea of one person being a great subject for a graphic novel. I heard George speak at, at a memorial service and the introduction they gave to him just it blew my mind because he he had a hand in, in so many incredible TV shows from the golden era. So it's George that we see a bigger story. And George is connected very intimately, very significantly with the Twilight Zone, with Star Trek, with Logan's Run, and oddly enough, even with Ocean's Eleven, because uh, it was George and a friend who came up with this story that was the basis for Ocean's Eleven, which that just seemed like, my goodness. But uh, it was that, that was his calling card that led him into the, uh, the industry, basically, because he could always say, hey, I'm responsible in, in a big way for Ocean's Eleven. And so he got to meet other people of a certain caliber. And, and George, what made his, it makes his story so fascinating is he he grew up in poverty. He grew up uh, at the the crash of the, uh, the Wall Street crash of 29. And he, he didn't have anything. So he just had his own interest in books, voracious reader, writer, and just a, a bundle of energy. And he somehow ends up in Hollywood. He left school at um, at eighth grade. He ended up uh, 
traveling around the country for a while, ended up in the army, and then just uh, got the love of his life, his soulmate. And with all that energy, he went to Hollywood, he met the right people, and bit by bit, he ends up being one of the writers for The Twilight Zone. And he wrote some of the most famous episodes, like Kick the Can, which I think mm -hmm. a lot of people will go, hallelujah. If you, if, I think you'll, a lot of people in the, in the audience will know what Kick the Can is. Yeah. Uh, a story. So it's a story about storytelling. It's about greater entertainment, pop culture, and a lot more. And specifically, um, the mm -hmm. two big kahunas here, because George wrote for all the great shows of that era, the two big ones are The Twilight Zone and Star Trek. So, and then what I was starting to, to do earlier in my presentation, what is great TV? What does great TV mean to, to, to different people? Do we really still have that tradition? I think we, we uh, Succession was the best example I could come up with. And that's not even really, it's not part of the big three networks. It's it's not something you would, you would see every week, although some people do, did enjoy it that way. I think that I would recommend <laughs> a show that you could go and, and enjoy week after week and then you chat about it. of course that happened with succession uh and how okay so my my question for you to process right now is how would you like to express your connection to your favorite tv show and I, i'm going to just show you an example because i'm trying to connect it to to, to my book george's run how can you guys do like a, a mini version uh some sort of connection to what i'm doing and one page that kind of fits right in is this page where I'm seated watching the Twilight Zone. Uh, the, maybe if I hold it up a little bit better. There we go. And so I, I'm commenting, mm -hmm. in the future, we'll see the Twilight Zone on our wristwatches, just like Dick Tracy. And, and the, the label here says, Henry, future blogger, age 10. You're a real geek, Henry. And my dad's saying, quiet down. This is New Orleans. And uh, it's funny because I'm talking about disruption. And even back then in 1973, the, the Twilight Zone was already kind of a, in a disrupted landscape. It, it, I wasn't watching the original Twilight Zone. I was watching a syndicated version of it. And uh, I uh, recently read in L.A., they religiously showed the Twilight Zone twice uh, in, at noon and at midnight day after day. So imagine how, how deep it entrenched the Twilight Zone. For people who aren't familiar with it, how deep it went into the American psyche. Um, and this, this is a lovely page here. It just, I, I try, I deliberately uh, take it at a slow pace. I, I gradually build up the story. And in this page, I'm teasing it out that George, I, I look, George is saying, I look back upon my life, I can reveal or hide secrets, I can tell you stories or not. And so that's the challenge that I have. I I got to know George. I had him on my show, on my Comics Grinder podcast. And I finally got to meet him in person at his home. Oh, and so wow. it's, like, it's like a detective story where I, I'm bit by bit, I'm, I'm uncovering secrets. And uh, he didn't reveal everything at once, or he would give me clues. He would uh, point me in the right direction. And then it was well, it was up to me to, to fill in the blanks. Some topics he, he didn't want to cover. He especially wasn't interested in talking about Stephen King. <laughs> I think he maybe thought of him as uh, as competition, or, or he's one of those young whippersnappers. But uh, and then I, I go into the Star Trek. There's a trippy uh, dream sequence where I, uh, on a puff of weed, I go into, into the world of Star Trek, and I talk to Leonard Nimoy and and to William Shatner, and I asked him, "What what is Star Trek? What what's it all about?" So uh, there's too much I won't be able to cover everything, of course, but that's just to give you a taste. And uh, as far as what we are going to be doing, I was thinking, let's try to keep it simple. I don't want to try to reinvent the wheel. I would suggest. Uh, well, I mean, you, you could go two ways. You could take your piece of paper and fold it. So you'd have it more like a like a like a mini comic. You could do that, or my preference would be just go ahead and use the whole page. I'm assuming assuming most people will use typewriter paper or something like that, or copy paper. And you have uh, the option of doing a comic and a cover. 
And I save the option because uh, well, I like giving people the freedom to not not to feel like they're they have a deadline and then they run out of time. I would focus on the comic if and then if you have time, maybe go back and do a cover based on on your uh, on your comic, and to, to to keep things on an even pace, I I would suggest maybe just going ahead and doing what I'm doing here for, for the panels. Let's go right ahead and make six panels. Oh, doesn't that feel better? You, a sense of accomplishment. You've all, you're already <laughs> six panels in, and then you uh, you think about, well, what is it that I want? What is it that I want to do? Do I want to, uh, do I want to uh, depict a scene? From a TV show or or movie, because like I said, we, we don't have to do a TV if you get stumped and you're not sure. Uh, do I want to depict it or do I want to pay tribute to it? Do I want to do uh, an observation? And for the longest time, I've not been able to get this out of my head. And I'd be be very amused if uh, if there's some people who've never heard of Fonzie. Are there, are, is, or is Fonzie still relevant today? The Fonz from Happy Days. It was the hottest show in the 70s. And uh, I just can't help but think of uh, that one show, the Notorious episode. And I wonder if this will re resonate with everyone. It was uh, Fonzie when he jumps the shark. Because that became a, a cool term for pop culture uh, author, uh, aficionados to use. Oh, this show jumped a shark. And what that basically means is this show has been on for so long. It's, it's it, Everyone knows the tropes. It, it's become a parody of itself. And Fonzie, unfortunately, did become a parody of himself. He became this, this commodity. He used to be, at the very, very beginning, this misunderstood guy in a leather jacket. And then he became... Uh, well, like uh, other shows, like on Family Ties, like Michael J. Fox, uh, he, he was the, the perfect uh, heartthrob to be on a, a lunch pail, a lunch bucket, an icon. So he ends up doing ridiculous things like uh, putting on jet skis, <laughs> and, uh, jumping a shark. What, what, what does that have to do with anything? So once the show jumps the shark, you know the show is like uh, it does just doesn't care. I think that's kind of what happened with the with Yellowstone a little bit. Now there there's a show that people enjoyed uh, tuning into, and I, I guess you you could binge watch it. I but I think there's a lot to be said for watching one episode at a time. So Henry, in the interest of getting people started drawing, yes. are you saying pick a show? A TV show or a movie that really resonates? Yes. Just uh, explore it across six panels? Or are you going to give us specific prompts? Well, I, I felt the pressure to uh, to perform and, and do something tangible. That's so why I started drawing <laughs> the fonts with the shark. But yes, what I encourage everyone to do is settle in, get your theme, and go to, go to town. I, I'm going to now start drawing and I encourage everyone to start now and uh just just think about what would I like to do I don't, don't think about it too much it may be like like I'm doing here just start drawing you can do a one page tribute maybe or if if you uh don't don't rush yourself either just take a little time to, to maybe write a few notes down of what it is that you liked about a show or what it reminds you of like say maybe the last episode of uh of Seinfeld or uh, or Buffy the Vampire Slayer, some some show that really speaks to you, and it could even be wordless. It could be just a character in in a in a moment. It could be the character in profile, at full face, uh, in the background. Memories of a show. That's it. That's it, guys. I I that's what I. Uh, that's the, the, you're off and running. That that's that's what I, I encourage you to do. Focus on the comic, and if you have time, do do a cover as well. And you can't go wrong. What do you think, Michael? Yeah, I think um, the theme, uh, Renee was just asking, I'm not sure there is no theme, so I'm just putting in the chat. The theme is to pick. 
a favorite um, TV show or movie um, and explore in comic form. Yes. Create some kind of narrative. I'm actually, I'll, I'll uh, I don't, I don't want to influence anyone, but I, I'm going to do one that I, I'm pretty familiar with, an episode from The Twilight Zone, Nothing in the Dark. So I'm just going to focus in on that, meditate on that show, and uh, bit by bit, I'll, I'll come up with something. And I, I really look forward to, to what you guys come up with. I'd also added it could be about your personal relationship with the show, like oh, exactly. where you were yes. in your life when you discovered it, or it could just be even disjointed images, moments from the show that stick with you. Oh, exactly. Yeah, that's basically a, a, a lot of the uh, the narrative flow to to my book. It, it's uh, it, it, it I, I deliberately have like a disjointed vibe, a daydreamy vibe to it, where one thought leads to another. Yeah, Audrey makes a good point. It doesn't necessarily have to be a favorite show. It could no. just be a show that um, sparked something in you. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a high quality show. It could be like a, a guilty pleasure. Or or a show your parents forced you to watch yeah. just on that was part of your your childhood or something you use as an adult to escape or um anything is anybody still still lost i see some heads down um Well, I, I I will admit this is a challenge because it, it's not just drawing, it, it's writing and conceptualizing, yeah. and it's a lot to to do in one one short go. So I I would I guess suggest don't overthink it. See see what you come up with with uh, your first initial gut re response to, to to this. It is. Um, I had a project that I did for second quarter. Sorry about that. That I'd like to go back. And we've got some interesting things coming through in the chat. Suzanne's talking about uh, going down the jump the shark rabbit hole. <laughs> uh, and Sarah is uh, recommending stream of consciousness, just thumbnailing 
with two characters, seeing what happens. And Nikki yeah. said she wrote uh, text in each panel, telling the story of watching a show and she's going back to Old Street. And I'm just drawing Mary Tyler Moore throwing her hat up in the air. Oh, that's great. There's a new documentary on Mary Tyler Moore I'm looking forward to seeing. Yep, I, we, we watched it and uh, we were, did not expect to be so moved, but we really, really were. Well, that's one of the memories that's, that sticks with me. I was watching uh, Mary Tyler Moore with my dad and he just looked at me and he said, now that's great television. Yeah. Don't get me started or I'll go on a 50 minute monologue about that show. <laughs> So Michael, I'll let you be our timekeeper. When uh, are we like reaching? Um, yeah, I think we should give people like another fifteen minutes to to explore. Okay. Um, and then we'll we'll start inviting people to share. Okay, good to know. Uh, yeah, speak. and we're just um, thinking about a show that we have some kind of relationship to or or movie and just kind of either um writing a narrative about it or just exploring mm -hmm. images from it to see what happens and you know sometimes what happens here is the exercise sparks a springboard into uh something else you know that people build on in their own time yeah. Well, that's the beauty of process. You discover things as you do them. It's good to lay down some marks everywhere to try to, it's like a magical ritual, but it's also practical to try to create a flow for the rest of your, your piece, even if you don't know where the rest of the piece will be heading.
So at this point, we have like about 10 minutes left, Michael? Yeah. Usually we start sharing around 7.40, 7.45, or when people start raising their hands, whatever time that is. And then I'll look at people who have like done a, a an oil painting, you know, with 25 panels and go, what the? <laughs> You ever use uh, photo references or is it all from your imagination, Harry? I will use photo references for sure. And, and then after a while, I, I tried to have it all uh, just get processed in my mind. And I'll, I'll try to go back and, and do things from memory. It's a combination of stuff. Amy, hey, we're just doing uh, almost like a visual meditation on a TV show or a movie that's important to you. I can't imagine what you would pick, Jamie. Uh, I'm being sarcastic because I know Jamie's obsessed with Jaws. Rocco's mm -hmm. wondering if copyright is an issue when doing a television or movie as a subject. I'm sure that there's some range of fair use. Um, I think it's it's fair game as long as a, if if it's a drawing, if it's a photograph, then you would uh, run into some issues if you use a photograph. Uh oh.
Take about five more minutes and then start inviting people to share. Michael, if you want, I, I can chime in and describe mine. Yeah, please. Um, I, I, my head goes off to anyone who actually got a cover as well. I, I just found myself focusing on the comics part of it. And uh, I'm glad I, I kept asking for the time because I, I started to speed up as I was running out of time. But Basically, uh, I wanted to focus in on the character from Nothing in the Dark, the, the old lady um, who's afraid of, of, of life. She's been avoiding Mr. Death uh, all her life, and she's outwitted Mr. Death. But to the, uh, she's paid a very high price because she's, she's always been incredibly cautious, so she's always been in the shadows. So I just have these uh, panels of her... Uh, with death just around the corner, or, or, or overseeing her, she's constantly in torment. She's running uh, scared, and then she just falls, and she's uh, just at, at her wit's end. Um, wow! On the ground, at at the end, she uh, has a revelation, and it's a, a, a handsome uh, knight in shining armor type of guy. And in the movie, or the I think of this particular Twilight Zone as like a movie because it's like a, it's like a mini movie. It's very cinematic, very much like a black box theater. It's it's, it's uh, really just an amazing piece. It's Robert Redford who's uh, there to to show her the way, and so she goes off with Robert Redford. And of course, Robert Redford's not exactly uh, Robert Redford. He's uh, or he's not exactly the policeman he claims to be. I, I I don't know. I, this is almost common knowledge. A lot, a lot of people will know the the story, but maybe there's a lot of people who don't. I I don't know. Some people might not even know what I'm referring to. That's that's interesting. But uh, it's a it's a classic Twilight Zone, and it's this uh, this woman's uh, relationship with death. Nothing nothing in the dark. Amazing show, and so many. Uh, people guessed it on it from Agnes Moorhead to Robert Duvall. Oh, yeah. Big part of my childhood, too. And I like to usually have a marathon somewhere around New Year's Eve. Oh, yeah. Well, the Sci-Fi Channel used to do that. They took it over from the LA affiliate because the LA affiliate was doing all those things. And then the Sci-Fi Channel did it. And I'm not sure where it is now. I think the Sci-Fi Channel still does it.
but it, it, that that's created a little bit of because uh, the Twilight Zone is kind of a misunderstood show. It, it its connection to the Sci-Fi Channel makes it more in line with science fiction for some people. But there's a lot more going on for for people who know that they'll, they'll, they're nodding, they're they're applauding. Okay. Yes, it's dark fantasy. It's it's a lot of other things, social commentary. Rod Serling is a big hero of mine, for sure. Oh. So anybody who feels uh, ready to share, even if you didn't get all six panels, whatever you got down, and talk about uh, where it's going, if it's only partially done, and start raising your hand. I see Edgar. Let's see. If we get a few more people. Cool. All right. Uh, why don't we start with Jamie's? Uh, yeah, I'll send you something, Jamie. Don't worry. And there's also the recording and the live stream. Okay, let's go to Edgar. I think I. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Listen, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, I I just thought of it tonight, but I've had a lifelong love affair with Leave It to Beaver, oh, <laughs> so okay. I'm do I'm doing a, a a story called Leave It to Edgar, and it <laughs> it will include both growing up watching Leave It to Beaver, then uh, in an Air Force class convincing six wow. out of ten people to watch Leave it to Beaver at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And then they would all ask me about it the next morning. And then having the chance to meet, uh, you know, uh, Jerry Mathers and Ken Osmond as Eddie Haskell and Tony Dow shortly before he died. So I've actually got a whole story here, but I told them how much I appreciated the good writing and the, the performing on that show. So anyway, this is my kind of uh, cover or first page of the story. Oh, I Amazing. love it. I love the idea of 1957 to 2023. It's very inventive. It's I love it. I want to see that as a mini comic or whatever you end up doing with it. Well, I I will do something with this because you've got my uh, you've got my interests going, and I had I you know I saw that the subject was TV shows or movies. I was racking my brain, and then it came to me. So thank you for this uh, this gift to me. Oh yeah, oh, that's awesome. Very cool. Thanks for sharing it, Kurt. How about oh, Marlena? Thank you. Hi, Marlena. You're probably going to want to uh, turn your background off if you're going to hold something up. Yeah, yeah. sure. I'll do that. Background. Uh, yeah, good morning, everyone, um, in particular, Michael and our host, Henry. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I am in Sydney, Australia, and I love the session of drawing comics. And so I was born in South Africa, but I have lived in Sydney for a very long time. I love movies and... Um, some of them are like these uh, Back to the Future, Paddington Bear, but I've chosen a documentary uh, of a different kind. I didn't draw the cover, no time for that, too mm -hmm. much to do. Um, <laughs> so Henry, I'm going to talk about a movie, a slapstick comedy called The Gods Must Be Crazy. Oh, mm. that's, I love that one. <laughs> Well, anyway, um, there you have a little um, grass hut with a few people sitting to the side. One is um, uh, pounding a bit of seeds to make flour and they are preparing for the day. What I've done is um, a comparison between traditional, the traditional lifestyle of the Khoisan Khoisan are the inhabitants of a very isolated desert area in West Africa, 
a little bit to the north of Cape Town. And that is where the Bushmen um, originated from after they left, left mid-Africa. Um, research proves that all of humanity has some of the DNA from the Khoisan. Even um, the Asians um, in uh, the Asian basin in the Pacific, believe it or not. And then um, I continue to um, draw the next bit where I'm contrasting the Bushman living of the Khoisan with a modern Western man in an airplane flying above uh, this bushland area. And he's just had a, a bottle of Coke and he decided, well, uh, he doesn't need the, the Coke bottle anymore. And he decides, he's going to decide to throw it through the window and says to himself, oh, okay. They may think it's a gift from God, mm -hmm. <laughs> knowing that uh, the Bushmen were below. Uh, the next one is um, a caricature where the bottle falls in the sand. And as you can see, I put plonk. It goes into the sand. And why does it land there? Do the Bushmen think in contrast to what the pilot did as an act of, I guess, littering? And then uh, next um, frame. Um, Guru is an elder of the tribe. He finds the empty bottle, picks it up, and blows into it and said, cool, I can use this for our music. So he blows into it and it makes a sound. And uh, all the children are so excited with this new um, object. And they do think it's a gift from God, I guess, because they've never seen a bottle in their life apart from, you know, nature, the animals, goats, baboons, wild animals, seeds and, and the like. And so the next caricature um, is about, um, uh, not Guru, but ZXI, who is the main character in the movie, um, who says, look, this is causing too many, many problems in our community. The children are fighting with it, hitting each other with a bottle on the head. Uh, the adults want to use it for various things to um, stretch the leather strips and, and the like. I don't think we, we need this in our culture. We should get rid of it. And they decide as a, as a group of elders that Z must take the bottle and go and throw it 20 days away from where they were walking into the ends of the earth. And so he continues to walk, comes across animals that he respects. A baboon grabs the bottle and he says to him, look, mate, I just need the bottle. You can't do anything with it. Give it back to me. Because he knew the baboons and the animals. And this is um, one of the, the highlights of the movie to show that the Bushmen are really um, interacting with the animals and nature. And so the baboon just drops the bottle and uh, he picks it up and continues on. Then he encounters a man in Botswana, which is the next state. And he's standing there with his telescope and he says to him, oh, I'm so glad to meet you, Z. Will you give me a hand in trying to scope this area? I, I, I'm trying to find out more about it and in what way I can assist because I am a biologist. And so he gives him close to where, as you can see, where he can integrate into this um, uh, Western culture. He, uh, he looks really odd in, that, in those clothes. But anyway, he looks into the uh, telescope and he sees a few things over a distance. And he, thought, he thinks to himself, this is amazing. Then finally, um, I'm just trying to show you. Yeah, we see. Can you see? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, finally, he um, he leaves um, Andrew, the the biologist, and he goes walking and walking for miles and miles until he gets to a cliff, where he says to himself, 
this dastardly thing I need to get rid of. And he swings it a few times in the air and hurls it down the abyss into the valley. And so this is the end of my story. And I, I love movies and I decided to do that instead. Thank you for having me. Nice. Thanks for sharing that, Marlena. Yeah, I think that that's very, uh, very impactful. You, you did a very nice encapsulation of the movie. Thank you. Well done. I see my old pal, Bruce McKay. Hey, Bruce. Oh. I unmute. Yeah, there you go. I do. Um, well, hands down, without even thinking about it, it's got to be Star Trek. Yeah. That's the reason I'm here today. Um, doing the graphic novel intensive again. Um, so this is what I got. Oh, good. Yeah. So what this is, is uh, backwards. Um, let me see if I could, uh, is there something I could do to reverse the image or? Well, I'm seeing it the correct way. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, I'll read backwards. As I can. Um, September 8, 1966. Um, let's see if I can get better focus on this. Uh, the first episode of Star Trek. I was uh, one month shy of my 10th birthday. Um, I just, I had to draw that ship. Um, <laughs> almost... Well, you can read it. <laughs> I can't. I thought I could. Uh, if you hold it a little more. closer, I can read it for you. The okay. first episode of Star Trek, I was one month shy of my 10th birthday. I had to draw that ship. Almost impossible with no internet. The one thing Star Trek couldn't predict, though, they did, mm, having trouble, opt. Oh, get a few things right. Get a few things right. Think flip phone. I went on to come up with mm, my starship developed. Sorry, Bruce, I'm having trouble with some of the words. From um, I went on to come up with such starship uh, such starship designs from 966 through 367. How would starships look 400, 500, <clears throat> 1,000 years in the future? Star Trek, I later would find out, was 300 years from now. Mm -hmm. yeah. that's me beautiful Bruce thank you thank well, you I love that face with the, the light bulb up, up, up above and of course that episode was uh, written by uh, George Clayton Johnson the, the subject of my graphic novel oh wow you did Man Trap yep Man Trap smoky it, smokies it wasn't, oh, the first was written, it wasn't the first written but it just seemed like the right show the, the right way to, to present the show for the first time yeah. yeah, yeah, I think the monster. Yeah, yeah. the networks from the monster would be would be <laughs> gripping. Very nice, Bruce. Thank you. I see VM uh, asked to unmute. Hi. Uh, yeah. Hi. Oh. Hi. Okay. Hi. I'm Beverly, and so this is the bare bones. But <laughs> yeah, when I was a genie. kid, I always wanted to be a genie because I loved I Dream of Genie. My goodness, yes. Yeah. Beautiful. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. That's an, I, I, that's all I got. What no, was it about Jeannie that um that grabbed you as a kid? Oh, you went back to mute. We just lost. Can you unmute? <laughs> Sorry. Oh, the magic. Uh -huh. She had. I always, you know. That uh, I just loved it. Yeah, and then they came out with the genie bottle one year. You know, oh, the, I didn't know the that. Movie, the... Yeah, yeah. It was the same with Bewitched. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really yeah. They haven't made an I Dream of Genie movie yet. I guess they will eventually. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I see Michael Wu. Thank you. Hey, Michael. Hi. Uh, so this assignment gave me an idea about um, creating a sequel to Succession called mm -hmm. The Godfather Meets the Media Mogul. <laughs> so on the left is uh, the, scene, the scene with 
Clemenza and Michael Corleone. And Clemenza says, come over here, kid, learn something. You might have to cook for 20 guys someday. But then I would merge it with the two characters from Succession, Tom and Greg. Uh, you may remember the scene in which uh, Tom asked Greg, would you, uh, would you be interested in a deal with the devil? And Greg says, well, what would I do with a soul anyway? <laughs> so this is based on the idea that all of life is about succession. Oh, I love it. Nice. Mm. Great contour drawings. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see. I see Renee. Uh, camera on, camera off. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Um, I saw. Um, this is not my favorite TV show, but um, I'm this. Oops. Okay. Um. So basically, it was 2014, and um, I'm looking at um a TV show, and it's um. I, I say, oh, Tim Allen's got a new TV show, Last Man Standing. Instead of two boys, he's got three daughters. I guess I can, <laughs> I can stand to watch <laughs> it. Um, and then the one of the epi um, you know, whatever. One of the scenes is um, if uh, Tim Allen is talking to his wife, and he's like, if man if Mandy is benefiting from Boyd's medicine, maybe. She has ADHD, <laughs> and and then I say, um, Mandy reminds me a, a lot of me. I wonder if I have ADHD. And then basically, I go to all these different psychiatrists, and none of them can diagnose me. I, I'm not going to read it all, but it's different reasons. And then finally, 2002. I go, I'm online, of course, because they are scared to see people in person. I'm on Zoom. And then they're like, oh, I can't tell if you have it since you're so depressed. But probably um, you don't have it and you just have depression. But you should have been diagnosed as a child and blah, 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 stuff I heard before. Um, this is down here. This lady, the... Um, whatever she was, psychologist, I think. She wasn't even a psychiatrist on Zoom. And then in 2003, I, I go to this um, webinar online. Again, a woman with ADHD, Palooza. And I'm like, oh my goodness, um, I must have ADHD. I can relate to everything they said. Finally, I get a psychiatrist, like, and this is like last month. And like, can you test me for ADHD. He's like, yes, I can. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Then he's like, I'll to learn to talk to my colleague and we'll meet next session and this is me. So I gotta wait and see what he says. It's, yeah. a, cool, it's a cool drawing style. It works well with the uh, evoking a conversation like the, like the words they flow and they spill over so it's, it's a very cool look oh this is all messy but thank you <laughs> you got yeah. cool renee i can personally relate to that story very powerfully thank you for sharing that thank you um i see ang or ang or bruce hi there Hi. Also, yeah, it's Anne. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this session. Um, it gave me a chance to draw about succession, which is my current <laughs> obsession. Um, there's a meme with Kendall Roy where they say he looks like this plush animal of a sad snail. Um, so I drew all the characters of succession as sad, different types of oh. snails. Nice. Oh, wow. Great. <laughs> so of course, Kendall's the sad one uh, for reasons. Um, Roman, Shiv, Kendall Roy, who was interested in politics at a young age, Jerry, and then um, Greg the Egg, who is significantly taller than all of the other snails, because that's how it looks like on the show. 
Um, but yeah, this is a lot of fun. And I'm currently trying to think of funny snail pun names for all of them. They're, they're all great. Uh, Greg is really spot on. I, th I think Jerry's probably the most spot on. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing. Here's our old pal, AJ Del. Hey, AJ. Good to see you. Oh, I finally made it to one of these because I really wanted to draw loop on. <laughs> um, so like, oh my God, wow. Loop on the third is probably my favorite show. It's a really old, like classic anime. It's still on, but you know, I, I haven't seen the newer seasons. I'm more into the older ones. So I just wanted to do like some drawings and try to get the same like kind of energetic character art style that they sometimes have. It's not as cl clear as I would have liked it, but he's kind of just like sitting around being Lupin, goes out, steals a bunch of stuff, runs over to Fujiko, is like, hello. And she's like being Fujiko. Then a goddess shows up and Fujiko wins because she stays winning. Anyway, that's all it had. Oh it has, my it's, God, a, those... it's a very bold uh, look to it, very stylish. I like it a lot. Thank you. Yeah, that's beautiful and stunning. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Mary, Mary Mueller. Okay. okay. Hi, Mary. Hi. So I, um, this is hard for me because uh, there's so many shows going back to the 60s that I just loved. And it's like, I can't pick just one. <laughs> but David Letterman was my TV husband. Oh, okay. Uh, right? Because, okay, I'll show you this in a I didn't do much drawing. I mostly just thumbnailed and looked for quotes and but what I what the thing that's meaningful about it is that I'm officially old. I miss the late night host from the bulk of my adult life, my TV husband. Today's light night late night hosts are fine, I guess. Um, and the thing I loved about David was his perfect balance between intelligence and sheer idiocy. <laughs> so yeah. So first I, you know, I, I started looking for some of his quotes. My favorite is there is no off position on the genius switch. <laughs> and it's just David sitting at his desk. This is um, uh, a performance I really loved by Gogo Bordello. Who they were a little bit more modern. Um, they're gypsy punks from Ukraine. And he's singing a song about the wanderlust king. And David says, walks up after they're done and he says, you ever been to Wyoming? <laughs> I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> and he had uh, stupid pet tricks, stupid human tricks. And he had a bit called, is this anything? Which um, I want to research and draw that a little bit more because it's hilarious. And so here's, here's stupid pet tricks, guys holding his dog and telling it to play dead. And then there was this woman who just like could pop her eyeballs out. And uh, which was horrifying. <laughs> anyway, no. I'm sorry, I didn't really do a full comic, but you know, I'm just no. exploring it because, um, you know. No, that's great. It's an initial notes that, that makes me think a little yeah. bit of, uh, of Linda Barry, just a stream of consciousness. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. That's a compliment. <laughs> There's our friend Chris. Hey, Chris. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, mine is about an old show from the 60s uh, with Patrick McGowan called The Prisoner. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, what does it say? Oh, yeah. I wish I didn't have to clean the house um, or pay the bills or sit in traffic or fight traffic. I, I just want to play ball and ride my bike. Mm -hmm. um, and the last one is, welcome home. I'm number six. <laughs> so this is Patrick McGowan, and then that's me. And in this show, 
there was this big giant ball that if you misbehaved, it would come out of nowhere and kind of smother you. And this was the uh, the bicycle that was kind of the symbol for you. So the prisoner was about this guy that lived in a village. He used to be a spy and he wakes up and he's in this village and everything is taken care of for him. But he's miserable because he's a prisoner in this little perfectly perfect village. And he's always trying to figure out who's number one. <laughs> anyway, it was a funny show. Thanks very much. I, I watched nice. a lot nice. of those episodes, but I I might have seen the last episode. I never figured out what the ball meant. Yeah. <laughs> well, the ball would chase you. If you tried to escape, the ball would chase you down <laughs> and smother you. Was that called <laughs> Rover? And it was a weather balloon. And... <laughs> yeah, it was like a big white weather balloon, right? <laughs> well, I love this uh, depiction of the traffic. The, the whole thing's great. Well, thanks. I had a really hard time drawing a row of cars. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Uh, Megan, your uh, camera's off. There we are. Hello. Hey. So I had, didn't finish one of the panels, but uh, here it is. Um, I love cartoons. As a teen, I discovered anime. My gateway anime was Sailor Moon. I love the art, action, and humor. Sorry, I keep turning. And I didn't quite finish this panel. I have to look up some of the character designs. Because of limited TV time, I never got the full story. But I love the kick-ass all-girl squad. <laughs> My tastes have changed, but I'll always be grateful to Sailor Moon for interesting me, introducing me to great cartoons. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, yeah, now I, I see it perfectly. I, I love the character. The, fa the faces are nice, and uh, it's just a nice slice of life. Really nice. Thanks for sharing. I see Ken and Mishka. Uh, ask you on you. Hey, Ken. Hey. Hello. Um, so I ended up just doing a, a single panel. But this is, um, see that okay? Uh, getting reflections. There we um, go. Oh, nice. There is. Nice. Better, right? Hopefully, there's not too much reflection. But um, this is, yeah, do you hear the idea is that, uh, well, my brother was visiting me a while ago here in California. And uh, we went on a road trip up to Sonoma County and stayed at the Occident, you know, this um, place called the Occidental Lodge. And we went from like sunny where we live, where I live, up, you know, and then it got really foggy and rainy and it felt like, a, well, we're both big David Lynch fans. Mm -hmm. And it just felt like driving into the world of Twin Peaks, um, mm -hmm. just completely like shrouded in mist and it felt like apart from the world. So, so I just sort of, this is the, I use a reference drawing. This is the Occidental Lodge in, um, but I just, you know, re-envisioned it as the Great Northern, which is the lodge from Twin Peaks. Nice. Well, it's it's really it's lovely. I really like it. It make a great opener. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. I can even feel that Pacific Northwest weather. Yeah. That draw really nice. Thanks so much for sharing, Mishka. Hi. Hey. Not sure if y'all can read that, but um, I have it there for you to see. Um. So I may have told the story here before, I'm not sure, but um, so my dad um, was a big sci-fi fan. Um, I, I have actually done a cartoon here before about Twilight Zone, but that was well covered today. <laughs> so, um, so 2001, A Space Daddy Sea, um, it's, it's full of stars. My daddy loved space and all its possibilities. He even worked on rockets. We still have his books and posters. A favorite one is down in the corner there, Pressurized Mating Adapter, A Bridge to International Cooperation, which since we're keeping things at PG here, I won't go into um, jokes that we make at home about it, but um, it it suited his raunchy sense of humor well, but he didn't get the joke when he was like, Daddy, that's really funny. Okay. All right. Before I was born, my folks immigrated from communist Czechoslovakia, leaving behind everybody they knew in the old world, unsure they'd ever see anyone ever again. So science fiction felt like a family memoir. Mm. Uh, this is a scene from 2001 um, where he's talking to his daughter. 
Um, the video phone sequence felt so poignant, that separation, the delays. Are you coming to my party? She asks. Uh, when daddy was dying, we brought our projector to the hospital and watched 2001 A Space Odyssey when he, with him in his room. Um, I'll interject that he like kind of barely mumbled um, Space Odyssey. <laughs> oh. He recognized it. Um, so what was really amazing is that um, the curtains were open and with the projector and the room being dark, it looked like the um, spaceship was right outside floating above uh, Golden Gate Park. Um, oh. that, the discovery went, it was really like such a cool effect. And then that final scene looked a lot like his austere hospital room. Um, and it brought me some comfort imagining my daddy transported to other dimensions, speeding through the multiverse. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Well, that could be a blueprint for a, a comic or even a graphic novel. Yeah, there wasn't really enough room to tell the story. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Thanks. Uh, thank you for sharing. Nikki, you can come on camera. Nikki, who started out as a squirrel. <laughs> there we are. There we are. Hi, Nikki. Mine. Um, I remember on Friday nights we'd give them the old jag, and Dad would take our kids down to the shop, to the shop, to the one shop down the road for fish and chips. And that was the days when they actually wrapped them in newspaper. And we'd sit in front of the tally as a family, and the old tally would go hmm as it was warming up and showed black and white snow on the screen. Dad had always hoped the aerial didn't need adjusting. <laughs> At 5 p.m. Inch High Private Eye would come on and we'd sit and watch as a family. Oh. Oops, sorry. Me, Mum, Dad and Simon. And we'd eat our fish oh. and chips happier times. And I've never seen it in colour and I just discovered it on YouTube in colour. So because we had a black and white television. <laughs> so I'm going to watch it in color after this, yeah, which is cool. I, I love that show. Uh, I've never also met anybody else that has watched it. So that's really cool that you've seen it. Yeah. Very, very weird and quirky. I, like, uh, I, like, like so many shows, for some reason, I, I think of Get Smart. Yeah. Either, either you love it or you, you hate the humor. It yeah. can annoy some people, I suppose. <laughs> but cool. I love your use of color. It's it's a very fun piece. Very nice. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Nikki. It's beautiful. Hey, hey, it's Jan Spence. Hey, hi. Hello. So um, mine is about all in the family. I'll show you. Oh, um, nice. This oh. is... Uh, Wow, is. you got a lot done. So, um, are you able to read the panels? Oh, yeah, no. you bring it a little closer. Do you want me to read it for you? Yeah, that would be great. So, I hated it all in the family when I was a kid. I didn't get why there was a, a show focusing on a nasty racist white guy. And everyone whined or screeched, too. And he just made fun of everyone. A little higher? It may have taken me sitting on a stoop in Hell's Kitchen, chatting with my very own Archie Bunker neighbor to make me re-examine. Uh, can't read that, sure. Why watch the show? Re-examine um, and, yeah, okay. and watch. To make me re-examine and watch the show with a more content aware and critical eye and begin to understand it was really a parody with a moral. It was also a character study of a man with a fixed growth mindset and how he changed and showed that even the most apparently fixed personalities still have potential for growth. It helped me to see a hardened man soften and show love. It helped and influenced my idea that people are ultimately redeemable. Wow. Yeah. I started to get a little weepy as I was reading that. Yeah. 
What great analysis. Uh, uh, Thank you. Really nice. Well done. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Cheryl. Hello. All right. I've got hey, the Mishka there. trick. Um, Sad your days of our lives. It's not my favorite <laughs> show, but I remember, I remember watching it in the nineties and I don't know when I would have done that because I think it was after Price is Right. So it was at 11 yeah. and mm -hmm. I would have been in school. So I think I watched it in the summertime and it, it, 90s, right? And so now I'm at work in the break room in 2023 and I look up at 11 o'clock and they're playing Days of Our Lives and it's the same characters from the 90s. I'm like, oh my goodness, how old are these people? I couldn't believe it. And like the women look as good or better than they looked before. But the, <laughs> the one thing that I remember, it's like, you know, the story goes on forever and they zoom in on their like, cheeks and eyes and there's this tense moment and somehow you're waiting for the next episode but I remember once there was this guy named Stefano and he had these like like pointy eyebrows and somehow at the end of one episode he met this purple alien that looked like a brain and I think it was wearing a, a hat and a <laughs> coat and it, it must have lasted maybe a minute and then I like called all my friends. I'm like, did you just see that? Didn't nobody had seen it. I tried Googling it just now. It's nowhere on the internet. It's like it almost didn't happen. So if there's anybody out there that remembers <laughs> this. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> That's so cool. Beautiful drawings. Thank, Thank you for you. sharing that, Cheryl. Good to see you. Or good to see your art. And, and was, did this happen recently? Or, or when did the purple monster This happen? was the 90s. Maybe Not the like 90s. Oh my 96, goodness. 96, maybe, maybe. Wow. <laughs> well, it's, it's very pretty. I, I love it. That The portraits are great. Did you do that all from memory or did you? Uh... Oh, I, I traced it. <laughs> oh, it's still great. It's still great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Wally Wood says it's okay. Uh, hey, Michaela. Okay, I have a, can you see it okay? Uh, it's a little blurry, but will you walk us through it? Yeah, I have a, it's about how I connected to the show Breaking Bad. Yeah. And um, there's on a lot of different levels, but this is about how I heard a song the first time by Niles Barkley. Um, who, who, can help, who can save my soul now? And so it's in the show... Mm. Um, it's, it's the first time it plays is after this really violent scene and Jesse and Walter are really, really shocked. And so I started really liking that song. And then I actually bought the soundtrack to the show and discovered all kinds of interesting stuff. And then the last panel is how I started using language by Jesse a lot. <laughs> <laughs> like it just crept into my mostly while driving alone in my car and other drivers I would never like do that in public but it was just so satisfying and I really identified with Jesse as a character I, I love how it tells a story it's very nice thank you thanks for having us thank you so much uh, let's see Cheryl shared. Did I miss anybody? I think we got everybody. Jamie said she's going to catch up in her own time. All right. I don't see any more hands. So, Henry, thank you so much. A lot of powerful memories came up. and Thank you. This was really great. Thank you. And usually this is when Tom says, everybody unmute themselves and say thank you to Henry. Oh, don't forget social media, um, hashtag Friday Night Comics or at Comics Workshop. And Henry, <laughs> what was your uh, contact information if people want to follow you? Oh, you can find me uh, on Comics Grinder. Actually, I just reviewed Tom Hart's B is Dying number five. Oh, nice. Yeah, so I hope you guys share your your work on on Instagram with those hashtags. It's a great way to see what everybody did, even if you didn't finish. Maybe you'll post it later. Thanks again, Henry. Thank oh, you. Oh, you bet.
Thank you. Maybe it'll be back sometime. Thank you. Yeah, I hope come back soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everybody. Keep it in comments. Take care. That was great, Henry. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. Fun on Instagram. Thank you. Thanks for honoring George Clayton Johnson. Oh, you bet. <laughs> yeah, I need to do some research. I want to read that book. How do you find him, by the way, Henry? Oh, well, it's uh, you can just go to Amazon, and I, I would appreciate you guys seeking it out and just go from there. If you'd like, uh, contact me, and I, I could uh, arrange for you to get a, a complimentary copy uh, if you might uh, consider reviewing it on Amazon. That, that would be helpful, too. Yeah, well, but I, yeah, I, I'm definitely going to get it. But how did you discover George? Well, I discovered George uh, when he did a tribute for uh, Richard Alf, who was one of the uh, co-founders of Comic Con, and I was there in 2012. Richard Alf had passed away, so it was a memorial service, and George was there to just do a presentation, and the introduction just blew me away of all the shows he'd been involved with. And so I approached him. I interviewed him on my show, and. Eventually, we, we we became kind of close. He has, he had so many friends, and he was such an open hearted person. He invited me into his home. Sweet. I'm I'm working on a comic about Elaine May, and um, oh wow, I'm making my head spin um, to try and do a a story about her and what her work means to me in twelve pages. It's been a struggle. Oh, you and have to get the, you have to get Mike Nichols' book. Uh, I have so many books. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, you the one that he wrote or the biography about him? It was the the recent biography on him. It's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, I I read about it. I haven't read the book yet. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, good night, everybody. Thanks yeah, for coming. Hope to see you next time. See ya. Good night.